Hi, uh, I'm Stephen McDonald. I um, work as a sysadmin for Anchor. Um, what I'm about to show you is something I made a few years ago. Um, I was going through a phase of... I listened to quite a lot of Frank Zappa and one thing that he used to do when recording live was to... Um, he'd have two guitar amps on stage, both mic'd up, and when he released those on live albums, he'd pan one hard left and one hard right, and it creates a very interesting stereo effect. And I, w <clears throat> I was experimenting with um, doing similar things for my keyboard. Um, I found using um, guitar, X, guitar amp effects worked quite well for electric pianos. Um, it's fairly straightforward to do stuff like that in Arda. Um, what I do is I just route each uh, channel of a stereo track to its own bus and then do effects on that. You might be able to do more sophisticated things with um, send-receive with Ladsper plugins. I haven't tried. Um, this particular thing is about a minute and a half that was cut out from a 20-minute jam session. Um, it, piano and drums, and I later overdubbed bass, but this is a draft mix, um, so there's not... you can't hear the bass too well. Um, in any case, the what I've done with the piano is um, the right side has just the raw piano track, and the left side actually has the piano passed through a ring modulator, which I found resulted in a very interesting effect. Um, I, tw I tweaked the ring, mo ring modulator settings. I found that It seemed that, depending on the ring modulator settings, it would the, the piano would shift from side to side, um, depending on the pitch of the note at the time, which um, I found curious. Um, I guess I'll play it. Um, that doesn't want to be coming out. I'm not sure if that, that it could be an issue with the laptop. I don't know if it's actually playing to the audio port.
Okay, that, um, that's pretty much it. I don't know how well the stereo image came out on these speakers, um, but if you'd like to download it, it you can get it at uh, music.sjm.so, um, along with a bunch of other... Okay. Um, yeah, sure. Um, I can email it to you. Okay. Thanks. All right. So next up, I'm going to um, play something that I set up. So for the streaming guys, we need to um, cut the streaming for this one. We stream an AVB, and the answer was, what is AVB? And so as my punishment for asking that question, um, I, <laughs> I'm up here to uh, provide a little bit of enlightenment. So um, presentations really, as you can see up there, you can go and read it yourself on Wikipedia. Um, there's a pretty good uh, page on Wikipedia. So AVB stands for Audio Video Bridging, and it's a suite of network protocols that are to, to do with uh, getting audio and video across a local area network with low latency or uh, constant latency, low delay, and guaranteed bandwidth between endpoints. Uh, so it's not particularly Linux-related at this point. Uh, other, I'll, I'll kind of touch on that a little bit later. So there are really three standards are the main ones that are involved. The first one they call... <coughs> somewhere where I stand... Uh, 802.1 AS. Um, it's here. Okay, yes, I can read. <laughs> it's right in front of me. Um, which is like IEEE 1588, if you've heard of that, which is uh, also known as PTP, Precision Time Protocol. And it was suppo it's supposed to be interoperable, but it's turned out that the way they've written the standard, it's not quite the same. So, <laughs> uh, so that's a way of distributing accurate time to kind of a nanosecond. Uh, resolution across the network so that every endpoint knows what the time is and that is cool if you want to display or render your audio uh, at the same time. It's meant to be accurate enough so that each speaker can be you know, off a different network port and they will be properly synchronised or you can, uh, can do that. So what this requires uh, it doesn't work with ordinary network hardware. It needs enhancements to uh, the low-level network hardware to do with to allow it to timestamp the packets as they go in and out, and the bridges are able to measure the time delay that, of the bridging of the packets. So that's the first part: is you can send stuff around and know exactly how long it's taken to get across the network. Second part is uh, let's see where are we. Uh, QAV, traffic shaping, so it operates, uh, so it doesn't uh, send giant packets across the network. Oh, thank you. The audio is sent across in uh, very small packets, I think maximum is 512 bytes, and they're sent out at an 8 kilohertz rate, so that's one packet every 125 microseconds, and you have to be able to send that accurately. So I'm not sure what kind of a challenge that is for the Linux networking stack to be able to do that. Typically, it requires some support in the hardware to have hardware queues that operate to cause that to happen with the right priority. And the third major part of the standard is emission controls which allows you to reserve bandwidth through a network, including the switches, from end to end, and so that you are absolved from having congestion from other stuff happening in the network and get your audio across there. So um, here we go. This diagram here, t the T in the red uh, square up there. Talker is wanting to send something to uh, the uh, listener somewhere. I don't know why it's called D here, but thing in the green circle, advertises its stream, says how much bandwidth it wants, all the switches will reply and say, yes, I can give you your bandwidth, and you're guaranteed to have that to get through. So um, that you know, means that once, you happen, once that happens, 
someone else doing a big file download is not going to disrupt your audio and video stream. Um, let's see. What I have here, why is it always render? Okay, that's the that's a big version of the. So, um, there uh, there is a kind of uh, commercial organisation called Avenue, uh, which is kind of promoting and uh, providing standardisation uh, work, so so that you can go and get your stuff certified at a price, of course. And so it's being driven by these guys, the founders, Intel. So Intel uh, is incorporating the technology into their uh, hardware. Uh, Xilinx, uh, Cisco into their switches. I'm pretty sure Apple is putting it into some of their gear. And so it'll become... You know, it's been around for... The standards were finalised in about 2011, so it's been around for a little while, but still there's no you know, full open source implementation, so that's kind of where it might be interesting. So there's a number of people using it in the pro audio uh, arena and in the automotive. And here we are, GitHub, OpenAVB. They're building up slowly the pieces of the system, which includes a protocol for discovery and control of the mixing elements. So there's a brief introduction to AVB. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you, oh, yes. Uh, one other oh. thing. If you want to kind of wag from the conference for a bit, there's an interesting show at the Art Gallery just down across Albert Park. Unfortunately, it only is open from 10 till 5 p.m., so you'll have to be shirking from your conference responsibilities if you want to see it. But might be worthwhile. Thanks for that. Yeah, that open AVB uh, thing is is interesting um, because uh, it's it's sort of conceptually in competition with a couple of proprietary um, things that have been set up to do the same sort of general thing. And it's going to be very interesting to see if the standard AVB stuff can actually supplant the proprietary stuff. Um, the biggest problem. Think might end up happening is mirroring the Firewire situation where there were Firewire audio standards and they're very good, but other ma but most of the manufacturers decided they could do key control things better than the standard, and so they use hooks to add vendor specific extensions and do themselves, which um, makes the standard the standard gives you a good foundation for it, but um, it then uh, key key things like mixer control and stuff. You need to do proprietary packet formats to get get things to go. So, that is included in the standard. yeah, but it's same in same in Firewire. It was in the standard, but everyone decided that the standard didn't apply to them, so they wrote their own. So, yes, it's it's fun. Jeremy. On here. Need to do that. Thank you very much. All right, that'll do. Amazing. Kia ora. My name is Jeremy, and I'm a boring sysadmin, but I also play the bassoon, and I'm uh, into music, uh, specifically classical music. Um, put up your... Yes, I know. <laughs> I, I really liked your talk earlier. Um, who here, uh, put up your hand if you know what a floppy drive is. <laughs> Uh, put up your hand if you've ever used a floppy drive. Okay. And you know they make sounds, right? Well, 
What if you could control the sounds that a floppy drive makes? Uh, who here has heard of making music with a floppy drive? Oh, there you go. Quite a few. Who here has ever made such a rig? <laughs> okay. Did you know that it's actually incredibly easy? Um, so a floppy drive, if you've ever pulled a PC apart and looked at the back of the floppy drive, you'll notice there's a plug for the power and there's also a plug where a ribbon cable goes into the back and it's got a number of pins. Those pins all do various things, but there's actually only three pins that we're interested in. Uh, one is ground. You always need ground. The other is direction. The other is step. So what you do is you... I'm not even talking about software here. <laughs> I'm talking about using crocodile clips on the back of your floppy drive. If you touch ground to the step pin on the back of your floppy drive, the motor uh, that goes along, which, which normally controls the head that reads the floppy drive, it will actually click. And you tap it again, it goes click. You tap it again, it goes click. And you keep tapping, it goes click, 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 like that. And that's called a stepper motor, um, as opposed to a motor that might drive a wheel or something. So a stepper motor means it just does one click at a time. And then, of course, you can only step so many times, and then the motor gets to the end, and then you have to touch the direction wire, and then it starts going in the other direction. And you know that music is fundamentally made of frequencies, right? So a low note is a low frequency, a high note is a high frequency. Uh, so if you have the motor going faster or slower, then, um, uh, then you can control the pitch. So um, that's... Uh, sorry. <laughs> So uh, that is a very easy uh, rig to build. So there are uh, a few main components. Please uh, tell us there will be a demo. Uh, not a live demo with real floppy drives. I do have a recording if anyone wants to hear it. So first of all, you have floppy drives. Uh, what I have are six floppy drives here. Uh, each with ribbon cables out the back. Yes, this is not safe. Well, I mean, it is safe. It's only, what, three, five volts, something like that. But it, uh, yes, it is prone to shorting out. Um, so these are f uh, floppy drives here. And what this is here, this is an Arduino Leo stick. So I, I received this in my conference swag bag at Ballarat. Uh, it sat unused for a, a year or two, but I finally put it to some good use. Um, so each floppy drive occupies two pins on the Arduino. One is for the step, one is for the direction. Um, the software running on the Arduino, I did not write. Um, I'm probably not clever enough to do that. There's actually software already out there called Moppy, M-O-P-P-Y. It's available on GitHub, and that's software that runs on your Arduino. And it also runs on your laptop. So uh, on your laptop, it's a Java program that reads a MIDI file, converts that MIDI file to a format that the Arduino can understand, the, the companion program on the Arduino, then controls the pins going to the floppy drive as appropriate. So here's a close-up of um, me doing some testing. So you can literally, without an Arduino, without a computer, with only electricity, you can, you can play with the floppy drives like this and make, make some noises. Uh, this is just getting it all wired up here. And, um, and this is a little circuit board that I made. Uh, I'm, I'm, I know nothing about electronics, but I, I knew how to connect wires from <laughs> one hole to the other. Uh, along here, this is the ground, and then I'm just connecting them to the um, various pins on the Arduino. The reason why I did this was so that I could um, plug in the floppy drives directly into the circuit board without needing all these wires sticking out everywhere. And um, yeah, that's pretty much all that you need to, to make your own floppy drive uh, rig. Um, does anyone want to hear what it sounds like? Yeah. Well, you... <laughs> I'll only play a short amount of it because it, uh, this goes, uh, wherever this goes.
the guy. You probably don't want to hear the whole lot, uh, but uh, no, no, I've only done that movement. So, so what you were listening to was the Queen of the Night aria from Mozart's Magic Flute. Uh, it's actually an ironic piece to do for the floppy drives because what the floppy drives have only a range of. By the way, let me know if I'm running out of time or anything. Okay, so the the floppy drives have only a range of about an octave. So what I do. Uh, is uh, t when I get to the top of the octave, I tend to just sort of wrap back down. So it's really like having an, an integer that, that, that overflows after, ev after it gets to eight. Uh, uh, but yeah, and, and what I tend to do is the floppy drives are really soft up high, really loud down low. So what I do is I tend to have two floppy drives sort of an octave apart just to get the extra volume for the tune. Um, the, uh, music is done using Rose Garden, which is just a you know, MIDI program. You could use any MIDI program. It's um, really fairly simple, and if you're interested in building your own rig, um, I'm probably completely useless to talk to, but feel free to talk to me afterwards. So, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so the last one is uh, Daniel Sobey, who's going to give us a brief overview, I believe, or yeah. something oh, about music brands. Stick this in. Or what is it, sorry? A P um, PDF. PDF with slides. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, who's heard about Music Brains before? Okay, cool. Um, so Music Brains is an online um, music database. Um, it, it's all cross-referencing different fa facts about everything. Um, it sort of started from CDDB. Um, CDDB went proprietary and became Grace Note. So these, this group of people that used to contribute to CDDB, went off on their own and started Music Brains so they could keep on tang their own music. Um, it's all licensed CC0 for most of it and CC by NCSA for the rest. Um, it's a GPL licensed server, there's GPL licensed client tools. Um, if you want to, you can run your own database, copy of the database if you want to play around with. Um, and then it's the basis for um, quite a few other websites. So Spotify use it for keeping track of artists and whatever else, and uh, BBC use it. Um, so BBC Music Reviews use the same IDs for everything. So And they've got a, a Twitter bot that when um, someone plays, this song gets played on the music, they tweet the artist say, your song was just played on BBC4 or whatever. So it's something that you can just hack and do things with it. Um, so it's, it's cross-linked information. So we've got releases, which is... Um, so it might be a CD, it might contain multiple mediums, so you might have 
two CDs in it, so that's one release. You've got each track, so a recording. Um, recordings have one or more artists, so if you've got this artist featuring this other artist, everything all sorts together, and you can have stage names, so if they just use their first name on one recording and their full name on other things, it all, it all gets managed. Um, there's works, which is sort of the song itself or the book or whatever. So if someone does a cover, it all links, this is, this is who wrote it originally and this is just a cover of this original song. Um, there's labels, um, the series. So some compilations and things have a compilation every year. So you can link, this release is the tenth of the series um, there's it keeps track of areas, so people were born in this country. They mainly work in this other country. Um, there's places, so you can have recording studio that things were made off, or a venue where a live concert was happened. Um, uh, they've just added events, to so you can start tracking who, which artists performed at events, and this live CD or live recording event recording was made at this place, so you can start um, mapping that together. And then there's URLs, so links to Wikipedia, Wikidata, all sorts of other things. So, oops. So the whole thing's relationships. So this thing record relates to this. So you have a group, so you might have a group and might link to who all the members in the group and then that might have their Twitter handles and whatever else. Um, so it's, yeah, artists together, artists write works. Um, you can add more data as you go so you can have such and such played the trombone on this recording. You can just add more data as you feel like. So, and for things like dance music, you'll have such and such remix this. So you've got the original people that wrote the song and these people re create a remix of this song. So everything all joins together, so. Quick screen, screenshot. Um, so this one, you've got cover art, you've got the barcode, um, you've got each track on the CD, you've got who played the guitar, drums, keyboard, synthesizer, um, what the song, the reference to the song, you've got the reference to the label, and when in each country it was released. So, it depends on how much time everyone puts into the, it, but you can end up with something like this. Just keep on adding more information as you feel, see fit. Um, it's a public database. Um, you just need to create an account. Uh, it's a web-based thing. Um, there's a voting system to help stop people making bad edits and approving good edits, so occasionally there's some people that just spam or whatever, so hopefully it goes through the editing system and gets caught before too much damage was done, and also helps encourage people that do the right thing, make improvements to get it be applied straight away. Okay, so... Um, what you want to do when you get home is download a program called Music Brains Picard and you throw it at your Music Connect collection and it should pick up, should search the Music Brains database and just start adding tags. So if there's any, if you've downloaded a random thing on the internet, it might actually be able to find out more information and as people update things, you do it next year and someone might have fixed 
things. So, and yeah, so it'll add tags, add cover art if someone's added it. And when I I use Sound Juices, my Audio CD Ripper, and that all automatically adds the tags to the database. Um, so they've expanded a little bit. Um, so the cover art archives um, a collaboration with archive.org. So because the licensing of cover art's probably a bit fishy, they've sort of outsourced that and archive.org's happy to have it. Um, Acoustic ID is sort of a fingerprinting system that they've got. Uh, Critique Brains, which is um, you can submit reviews on the, on releases, and Acoustic Brains, which is um, um, automatic uh, metadata, so you can find it can sort of predict uh, the the um, if something's danceable, what, um, how many beats per minute, and what the probable, um, yeah, just probable th factors of all these random things that they've automatically found. Oh, anything else? Okay, thank you. I'll put this to you in a second.